Hello everyone. Welcome to Frequency Ball and Summer Music Connection 12, Music and the Natural Worlds, Video 8. And I'm calling it The Fundamentals. Probably a lot of you who have been playing a while, you hear your teacher talk about, now really let's get into the fundamentals. And you've probably been working on fundamentals from the very beginning. And that reminds me of a wonderful little song from The Sound of Music. Remember that? Those of you who have seen it, maybe it's not that common anymore to see it. But some of the songs are still popular and some of the sayings, I think, still hold some weight. Let's start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. And this is when they're talking about do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And they say ti, do. And it's actually really great how simple that is. And that phrase is the key to good communication as well, which I think we're missing a lot of these days. Let's start from the very beginning. So the very beginning on any instrument, because we're going to talk in musical terms about fundamentals, that subject can go anywhere and everywhere, can it? Is Let's see if we can make a sound. Because every musical instrument is a sound producer. It's a tech, it's a mechanic, it's a technology, whether it's a trombone, a contrabassoon, a bass clarinet, a piccolo, a viola, or a snare drum, a harp, you name all the different instruments, electric guitar, a voice, they all produce sound and they're designed to produce sound. And they're fundamental. They're designed a certain way to produce a certain sound. And so when teaching someone, let's start at the very beginning, you're showing them right away well, let's see about sound. Maybe just hand someone the instrument and see. Let's see what you can do with this. Because they've probably heard it. Maybe that's why they want to play that one. Unless someone forced them to play it. But still, the situation's the same. And they pick it up and they go... <laughs> and you go, great! That was a sound! That's what I'd say. That's exactly what I'd say. It was a sound. And that's starting from the very beginning. And then we go, okay, but the trombone can also do, they can make that kind of a sound. And the interested person will say, Oh, how do I do that? And then they want to know how. So first, there's some basic information. Once that initial initiation <laughs> into having them produce a sound, you say, okay, well, as you know, because you put, you put your mouth in the right place, um, this is a mouthpiece, and it can make a sound by itself, and a slide, and here's the bell, and here's the spit felt, this is a slide handle, and this is a tuning slide, and that's about, I think, all you need to tell someone right away. You don't have to give them a full Gray's Anatomy of the trombone. Because not only do they have that machine, 
they have this machine to learn. You can't have one without the other in terms of the sound, right? So then you say, okay, well, there's something called our lips, and we call that an embouchure, and we have a mouth, don't we? And you take in a breath, because this might take a lot more breathing than just talking. And the beauty of this kind of speaking for the teacher lets them reconnect in a very simple way to the basics, to the fundamentals of what create a sound, for example. So what are fundamentals? Well, we've been talking about it. And at a certain level, you start from the very beginning. But then now let's jump ahead many years. The player is pretty good and they learn that, you know, there's qualities needed. A development journey is in front of them. And they start to realize how important what we would say healthy or having good foundational skills are to be able to say more on our instruments, to move to a greater level of proficiency and efficiency and expression. But it's incredible to me how when I'm hearing you know, advanced high school students and college students, how some of them who are very, very good just think their fundamentals aren't good enough. The sound doesn't stay absolutely as even as it could. The articulations sometimes aren't as consistent as they could be. Maybe they run out of air too soon on a regular basis. Maybe their intonation isn't as good as it should be. And so we start to think, okay, what does it mean to say to have a very good foundation that can maybe get you a job in a professional situation? Right? Now, is that different for the jazz player as it is for, let's say, the symphonic or chamber music style player? Is the criteria the same? And here's where we get into some real basic criteria. It's called rhythm, pitch, and timbre. And that actually is the core foundation of music's arising. Actually, that's wrong. Not the arising, but the body, the tripod of where how music expresses itself in this domain we're in, the world, the physical world. It wouldn't, music wouldn't exist in the way that we know it if it wasn't rhythm, pitch, and timbre. So we work that into a person young. Okay, here's how to maybe get a steady rhythm. You put a metronome their way play back and forth, they get ensemble experience playing with other people. I'm sure people now are recording themselves at a young age. So if you're looking at rhythm and then there's pitch, where is the intonation good? Where is it not good? Are there tendencies? Do you have a tendency to be flat on a certain note and sharp on another note? 
We have a tendency just to be flat in general or sharp in general, for example. In other words, we get into the realm of control. And that brings up the element of, are we consistent? Can the timbre of our sound be even? Because then we get into range development, high and low, and then we get into speed. Now we're into all these things even when we're younger, in elementary school and junior high, we're starting to get into that stuff. But what's happening in the fundamentals is we can always see how they can refine. I'm going to throw this into this. Are we having fun with our fundamentals? Or is our, are our worry about not having good fundamentals getting detrimental? Now, now I'm talking to more advanced players who are very, very concerned about going through that little teeny mouse hole from the preliminaries to the second round of an audition? Or will their recorded audition even make it to the next round, which is a live round, which might be a first round? So how we think about fundamentals, of course, will change through our own development. But one of the things that I think could even use more attention um, is where is our fundamental attitude? Now this would be more the, the driver of this vehicle of the fundamentals. Where are our attitudes? What in us is preventing our fundamentals from being fun or consistent? Are we looking at our machine, our body? Are we taking care of it? That's going to affect our fundamentals. And if it doesn't at an earlier age, it probably will in a later age. And so now, how do we uphold our fundamentals? And so certain foundational things can be there more of the time for us. Now we get into the field of warming up and maintenance practice to uphold our fundamentals. Because, you know, we have a house and it has a good foundation made out of stone. Now, I don't have to, which is a really good thing, <laughs> have to go outside and build the foundation of the house again every day. That's really good news. That would take up a lot of time. But when I was playing a lot within the orchestra and the quintet and other things I was doing, I made sure I was with that fundamental practice every day. And I would start out with what we would consider very basic things. And we all know what they are. But do we let ourselves advance in our fundamental approach to the fundamentals? So I would call that working on a legato articulation of a certain kind of legato. And I was just really focusing on my tongue leading the air. Now some people might think, oh, the air should lead the tongue. It's a matter of semantics, really. 
Do some people feel better when they're thinking about the tongue moving through? And some people feel better if they're thinking about the air moving through. Some people feel better when they're thinking about the quality of the sound that they want leading through. Some people might think direction. Just the movement of the sound. Because it does move. So, what if I added other elements to that? Other elements that are possibly, let's say, another elevated way of using what we have in our conceptual or thought or connection life to empower our physical fundamentals. I was thinking of the color red. I thought my breath was red coming in, a mid-red, but, a, but a, kind of a brightness to it, but having some depth. Look at all the things I'm adding to it. And then had it come out in that feeling of what the red would do. I know I've talked about color before, but how do we actually weave in what we think, what we might think are, you know, well, that's kind of an abstract concept. No, it's not. No, it's not. Color is a part of the natural worlds, isn't it? Don't we love that blue sky with some beautiful white clouds maybe going through it? And then maybe the dark ones come in, you know, but then there's this mix of all these different shapes and a beautiful, you know, sun you don't want to look at too long because it's a star. So if I think of the sun and that kind of yellow feeling and what it does to me, and I play this passage. Now, whether the sound to the listener is coming across. It probably would. It gets subtle, but it probably would. I don't know if it will on this recording, but me playing it, it had the strength that I liked of the red, but because I was thinking of the sun and how it generates, that got into me. And the feeling of that light and the consistent moving through it. And it just changed everything. So adding different nuances from nature into our fundamental practice connects us to the, some of the fundamentals of life in the physical worlds. And our body's physical. So wouldn't you think that if we're connecting to something physical in the natural worlds, that our bodies will respond. So this is some food from thought for thought. And you can say, oh, you didn't talk about how to really make a good slur. Well, we can do that some other time. And I would have to say, well, what kind of slur? And first, if I was starting with a young student, right, I'd say, well, here's an idea of a slur. Can you do it without putting anything on them at first? So they can actually have the natural opportunity of discovery. And from there, I can be assisted. 